life-altering story of the resurrection of Christ. That event changes us. It comforts us. It motivates us. Unfortunately, not everybody views the resurrection in the same way we do. Since the very beginning, people have been trying to find a way to deny the truth of the resurrection and the implications of Jesus rising from the dead. And as we come to the to near the end of our study of the Gospel of Matthew, really the study of all the Gospels, uh, we have one more week next week. We'll be looking at the Great Commission. But as we near the end of our time in Matthew, we... Last week, or the week before last, we saw the immediate response of the followers of Jesus, what they did, how they ran and they told and, and all these things. This morning we're going to look a little deeper into that, but first we're also going to look at the immediate response of the Jewish authorities in regards to the resurrection as they try and get out in front of what's happening and try and squash the truth. So our, our passage this morning is Matthew 28, verses 11 through 15. And we read, As the women were on their way, some of the guards went into the city and told the leading priest what had happened. A meeting with the elders was called, and they decided to give the soldiers a large bribe. They told the soldiers, you must say Jesus' disciples came during the night while we were sleeping and they stole his body. If the governor hears about it, we'll stand up for you so you won't get in trouble. So the guards accepted the bribe and said what they were told to say. Their story spread widely among the Jews and they still tell it today. So what we see here is the, the elders and the leading priests seeking to get out in front of this and to control the narrative. Isn't that just like government? It's ironic that they bribed the guards to say that the disciples stole his body. If you remember, that's exactly why they went to Pilate and asked for guards, so that this wouldn't happen. So in the back of their minds, we have to think that they knew this was going to happen. So they're trying to get out in front of it. And they bribed the guards. Now, that must have been some kind of bribe because anybody want to guess what the punishment was for messing up something like that? Yeah, death. Yeah. So let's look at the plausibility of what the Jewish leaders are saying. Is it really plausible that the disciples could steal the body of Jesus? I think the answer is no. I mean, the tomb sealed. There were guards present that they couldn't overpower. They had no real motive to steal the body. These disciples, they were men who were crushed and defeated. They were hiding. They were locked away inside an upper room. Pulling off something like this was not in their thinking. They had no time to plan for it, no resources to carry it out. And as you look at the resurrection, there are some basic facts that have to be accounted for to explain the resurrection. The first is that Jesus died and was buried. One of the popular theories of days gone by is that, well, Jesus really didn't die. He passed out, or he was in a coma. And when they put him in the tomb, the coolness of that tomb, and, and, a, and after a day, he, he came back around and was... People thought he had resurrected from the dead. That's not plausible because the guards were skilled, I mean, the executioners were skilled at their jobs. If someone survived an execution, the executioner was killed. So it's not plausible. But also, they pierced Jesus' heart with a spear drawing blood and water, indicating that they really did pierce the pericardial sac around his heart and into his heart, and blood and water came out. They did this to make sure that Jesus was dead. Besides, Roman Jewish sources acknowledged that he was dead. And a revived and barely alive Jesus would not have been able to move the stone. 
He would have not convinced anyone that he was risen from the dead in that state. And then there's the fact that the tomb was empty. No body has ever been presented to be Jesus Christ. Now, through the years, they've been skeletal remains that have been flagged by people, but they have been disproved. So the tomb was empty. Jesus' disciples saw it. People saw him, talked to him, ate with him after the resurrection. Not one time, but many times over a period of 40 days. Many eyewitnesses. And then there's the fact that the disciples were transformed. Something happened to these guys. They went from being afraid and hiding in a locked room to being on fire. They were running to people now to tell them the truth of Christ. They did this even though their lives were threatened by death. Now, to discredit the resurrection, you have to find a way to explain the change in their lives. So, those are some of the facts of the resurrection. I want to talk briefly before we get back into how we respond to the resurrection with some objections that are raised in light of the resurrection. They still float around, and they still pop up from time to time. And the first is that, well, the disciples made it all up to further their cause. That's a, that's a very popular idea that, that's found in many different forms. But this idea is that the disciples of Jesus wanted to save their movement, so they fabricated a lie of the resurrection. Now, one of the biggest problems here is that the number of people who saw Jesus. I told you a couple weeks ago about a, a cold case detective named J. Warner Wallace who wrote a book. He was a former atheist. And he investigated it as he would any other cold case mystery. <clears throat> and he became a believer. He writes this. He says, I am hesitant to embrace any theory that requires a conspiratorial effort of a large number of people over a significant period of time when they personally gain little or nothing from their effort. This theory requires us to believe that the apostles were transformed and emboldened not by the miraculous appearance of the resurrected Christ, but by an elaborate lie created without any benefit to those who were perpetuating the hoax. Now, common sense says that the more people involved in a lie, the sooner that lie is going to be exposed. So this is not a lie. Warner's point is a good one. What, point, what would be the point of making this up? And why would men be willing to die over a lie? If it was a lie, it's likely that someone in the group would have told the truth in time, especially when they were faced with the threat of death, as each one of them eventually would be. Chuck Colson, who was convicted in the Watergate scandal back in Nixon's day, he said this. He said, Watergate actually convinced me of the truthfulness of the resurrection. He said the idea that, the, that these common and mostly uneducated disciples could cover up something like this for decades without somebody telling the truth is ridiculous when 12 of the most powerful men in the world couldn't hide a lie for three weeks. So, and then there had been this explanation or objection that, that says that well, the disciples were delusional from their grief and from their loss. Now, it's not unusual for people who have suffered a loss of a loved one to have some kind of an experience. I remember when my grandfather died. The very night after he died that afternoon, I had the most vivid dream that he came to me. We sat down on the front porch where we always talked, and we had this long conversation about how things were going to be all right and how we needed to take care of Grandma and all of this stuff. It was so real. But folks, it was just a dream, all right? It was a dream. So, it happens to us. Those types of dreams. I still dream of my dad and other people that have gone on. I still have dreams, and they're real. Conversations that seem real. But it doesn't mean I'm delusional. It just means that I had a dream of that person. That's not what happened with the resurrection of Christ. It didn't happen... 500 people saw it at one time. Were they all having a dream? Were they all delusional? No, absolutely not. Common sense says not. 
And then we see that uh, there's this explanation that the disciples' observations were distorted through time. And yes, this says that Jesus was dead and that he remained dead. But over a period of time, the story expanded to the point where, oh, Jesus was resurrected. Now that would be the theological equivalent to the game that you play in grade school called telephone. Anybody remember that game where the teacher whispers a phrase into one student's ear and then they whisper it to the next person, to the next person, to the next person. I remember the first time we ever played that game, I was in this same fifth grade class. And the phrase was whispered into one guy's ear. And by the time it got to the end, she said, stand up. Alan Klein was the kid who got the end of it, and he was just, his eyes were, he was just like, so he stood up and she said, what's the phrase? And he said, I crazy. <laughs> the phrase the teacher had told the first student was Peter Piper, pick a peck of pickle peppers. So you see how things can be changed, but that's not what happened here. That would be the theological equivalent of something like that. Again, there's no evidence for it. The biblical documents are written within just a couple decades of the resurrection of when these events happened. There are numerous copies of these documents, which is significant because it would show that when you copied one, if there were changes from one to the other, and there were none. It's not like you go to the Bible bookstore today and buy 20 Bibles that are mass-produced, right? No, these were all handwritten copies. So you'd be able to tell if there was any change. The sheer magnitude of the documents argues for its accuracy. There is no evidence of any significant change to those. And one of the earliest... Christian creeds is found in 1 Corinthians 15. We actually used part of that for our affirmation this morning. It says this, Christ died for our sins just as the scriptures said. He was buried and he was raised from the dead on the third day just as the scriptures said. He was seen by Peter and then by the twelve. After that he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some have died. Then he was seen by James and later by all the apostles. So 1 Corinthians was written around 55 AD, 20 and a couple years after the death of Christ. The creed was quoted, it was already in existence, which means that it was earlier than 1 Corinthians was. There were still people alive that could verify the claims. They didn't just write this down 200 years after it happened and say, oh, that's the best that we can remember. No, from the very beginning it was documented. There are still people alive that can verify the claims. Now, the Bible is probably the most scrutinized and yet the still most reliable documents that existed. The Bible has thousands of manuscripts from all different times through the years to compare to, and some are, are near from the very time of the writing. Archaeology today is still proving, uh, regularly authenticating facts that have been disputed in the past about things. A person who is willing to look objectively will reject the notion of the, of the story of the resurrection being fabricated. Now, there are several facts that argue to the validity of the resurrection. Now, I'm just going to hit on a few of them. I uh, mentioned last time that uh, the first witnesses were women. At this point in history, a woman's testimony would not be accepted in court or anywhere else. So if you were going to make up a lie, fabricate a story, you would not choose to make the women your first witnesses or your primary witnesses. And then we have those dramatic conversions. It says that James saw him. Now James was Jesus' brother. And we read in Scripture and in the Gospel that it tells us that during Jesus' ministry before his crucifixion, his family thought he was crazy. They didn't want anything to do with him other than to retrieve him, to rescue him from this, his craziness and you know, put an end to all this. But we're told that after the resurrection, Jesus appeared to James. And James had a dramatic conversion. He went from skeptic to being a leader in the church. And then had he explained the conversion of Paul. He was the most fiercest opponent of the church. And it all would change in the flash of a light. And Jesus was there, and he said, Saul, or Paul, why do you persecute me? Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you? I'm Jesus, the Christ. 
How do we explain that apart from an actual resurrection? The presence of embarrassing details in the story leads to its validity. Not only were the first witnesses women, but Jesus had to be buried by two members of the Sanhedrin because all of his disciples had run off. If you're going to make up a story, most people are not going to paint themselves in a bad light. And then most of the disciples we see were martyred for their belief in Christ. Now that is a ridiculous length to go to for a lie. People are not going to do that. The disciples had nothing to gain by lying. And then we have the sheer number of witnesses, as we said earlier. Paul talks about there being over 500 people who saw Jesus at one time. He was seen dozens of times by different people. Which means, folks, if you want to be a follower of Christ, you don't have to turn your brain off, right? But you do need to open your heart and follow where the truth leads. So if the evidence is so compelling, it's natural to ask, why do people resist the truth? Why, after the testimony of their own guards at the tomb, did the Jewish leaders and the priests work to discredit the facts? I mean, these men had waited their entire lives looking for the coming of the Messiah. When it happens, why do they try and cover it up? Why do they turn away from it? Well, the answer is simple. They don't like the implication. And many folks today don't like the implication of a resurrected Jesus. Any honest person who resists the resurrection of Jesus today is in that same category. They know instinctively that, that if Jesus is who he said he is, if he is who the Bible says he is, if he did arise from the dead, then he must be the Son of God. And if he is the Son of God, then he alone should have priority in our lives. And they don't want that. They don't want to subject themselves to the lordship of anyone. People resist because they don't want to be subject to God or anybody else. They want to create a God that benefits them. We want a faith that we can put on a shelf, a faith that, that doesn't mess with our everyday lives, a faith that, that we can call on when and if we, we need and in our own terms. You see, we want convenience, not discipleship. We want a God who serves us, not a God who calls us to serve we want to do all the things that we want to do and anything we feel like doing without guilt. We will serve a God that fits our agenda. But if Jesus is the Son of God, if Jesus is who the Bible says he is, if he really did take our sins upon himself and pay the penalty for them in his death, if he really was dead and placed in the tomb, if he really did rise from the dead, well then he alone is the only authority on what is right and what is wrong because he really is the way, the truth, and the life. His word becomes a blueprint for the way that we should live our lives. The Bible is more than just an academic text. It's more than a history book. It's a survival manual, and we are accountable to Scripture and accountable to our Savior. In our sinful nature, we rebel against Anyone or anything that tries to tell us what to do, and that holds true for God. The resurrection messes with our lives, and therefore many people resist the truth of it. So what is a proper response to the resurrection? Well, we should do what the disciples did. First thing we see is that they followed Christ without reservation. They followed Jesus boldly. Even after he ascended to heaven, the disciples lived their lives by what he taught them. And let's face it, it only makes sense to do that. If Jesus is God, who became man to save us and then rose from the dead, why would we want to follow anyone or anything else? Look at it this way. How many of you like to read? Anybody got a favorite author? Who's your favorite author? You didn't think I was going to ask you. Mm. Moses. <clears throat> Moses. Moses? Yeah. Well, this is going to be a far stretch for that, but if Moses was still alive and he wrote all those things and he was coming to town, you would probably go meet Moses, wouldn't you? If you could. I like Max Altea. I've got a lot of his books. I've got a lot of e-books. I've read just about everything the man's written. 
if he was somewhere close, I might would go stand in a line and buy his new book and, and talk to him for a minute. How many of you have a favorite musician or band? Guess it's starting their last tour, right? You're going to go, ain't you? You're going to get tickets. You're going to go. You're going to try and stand in a long line and get a picture made with them, get an autograph. That's what we do. That's what we do. Folks, how much more should those type things be true of our relationship with Christ? I mean, you think of our children. We're devoted to them, sometimes almost to a fault. We will go without eating, without clothes for ourselves before we would let our children go without something we think they need. We change our schedules. We, we find time to go see every game, every performance, everything they do. And when our children need us, we drop everything. That is the kind of relationship we need to have with God in an order of priority. That change needs to take place because of the resurrection. If Jesus is the Lord of life, if he is truly our Savior, our strength, our fortress, our companion in all things, if he is the one that's gone to prepare a place for us and promises he will come again and take us to be with him, then why should we pursue anything else? We should pursue him and serve him with every ounce of strength that we have. Why would we not want to make him the highest priority of our lives? If we are devoted to lesser things, why would we not be more devoted to that which is the greatest? And then we see that the disciples realized that they had new freedom because they had really been forgiven. The disciples were changed because they had been changed. They had been set free by the truth of the resurrection, given a new freedom, newfound forgiveness to go forth with. <coughs> And as followers of Christ, folks, we have been forgiven. And that's good news. All the rebellion, all the poor choices, all the failures of our lives have been forgiven by Christ. He has set us free by his grace. We no longer have to look over our shoulder, afraid of, of the hidden things in our lives coming to light. We don't need to pretend that we have it all together when we don't because, hey, we are forgiven. We are free. So if we have been forgiven... How much more are we able to forgive? We saw that played out with the disciples. We we're told that we should forgive one another as Christ has forgiven us, and they took that to heart. Stephen, the very first martyr, he prayed for those who were stoning him. Father, forgive them, because they don't know what they do, even as the stones were in the air coming at him. He was praying for their forgiveness. When we embrace the message of the gospel anchored to the resurrection of Christ, we experience this profound freedom through forgiveness of sin, greater than anything that we might be asked to extend to anyone else. So if we appreciate what we have been afforded, what we have been given, if we are listening to Jesus when he calls us to forgive, we will choose forgiveness over retribution or vengeance or rebellion every time. We will see what a person can become by grace rather than, than what they are as held prisoner in their sin. And in the process, as we do that, we become even more free. And we see that their priorities were altered. The disciples gave up everything to proclaim the message of salvation. Now, they, they had given up a lot of things just to follow him. But after this point, they gave up everything, including their lives. <laughs> Tradition has it that every one of them, except for John, was martyred. Every one of them. And John was sent off to a prison island. They endured all kinds of things while they were alive. They, they traveled long distances to foreign lands. They risked their lives, endured hardships and beatings and stonings. Also, they could tell others about Jesus and the forgiveness and freedom that he extends. Once we understand that we are living now to live again it makes a little sense then to only live for the here and now once we understand that we someday will all stand before god it changes the way we look at life we endure it more we give more freely our priorities change we put christ in the number one spot we see beyond ourselves and we live every day planting seeds for eternity and the resurrection, just as it did for the disciples, will for us give us a new perspective 
on this. We no longer find ourselves overcome by hopelessness because we know our Lord is working all things for the good of those who love him who are called according to his purpose. We will grieve differently when a loved one dies because we know that anyone who is in him, even though they might die, they will live. And when life becomes hard, we won't just roll over and moan all the time. We'll look for ways to glorify God even in the darkest hours in the belief that his grace is sufficient and that when we are at our weakest, his strength shines through most clearly. We come to Christ by faith. But faith is not naive. It is not a matter of believing something that doesn't make any sense because faith is anchored to the truth. And that truth has a name, Jesus Christ. But here's the bottom line. The resurrection of Jesus will always have its detractors. A lot of intelligent people will come up with a lot of foolish and empty explanations for why the resurrection is not true. <coughs> That's especially true in, or common in academic settings. Each one of us must examine the issue for ourselves. But it's not enough to simply believe the resurrection is true intellectually. You must believe it practically. And when you do that, it should radically change your life, just as it did the disciples. Priorities will shift. The way you relate to others will shift. We understand every person that we meet will either be in heaven or hell. That will change the way you deal with others. The Apostle Paul wrote, If our hope in Christ is only for this life, we are to be pitied more than anyone in the world. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. He is the first of the great harvest of all who have died. Folks, if the resurrection of Jesus Christ is not true, <coughs> we're wasting our time here this morning. We're wasting our time to read Scripture if that is not true. What do you believe? Who and what you believe is a matter of life and death. It is a matter of heaven and hell. The question is, for you, have you examined it? Have you embraced it? Has it changed your life? We'll stand and sing our closing hymns. Rock of Ages, question.